Hi ladies, welcome to Women the Word. I'm Shelley Davis. I'm part of the teaching team. I'm always excited to be here studying the Word of God with all of you that are joining us at the South Campus. And if you're joining us on the internet, we're glad that you are here. As you can see, I've got kind of a unique set behind me. It's Kids Camp Week at Christ Chapel. I hope that has been something you've been able to take part in as well with your children. It is a blessing. Now, how many of you have a unique story to tell about your own birth or the birth of one of your children? Uh, I remember my parents telling me my birth story, which was a little bit unique because I was apparently due the week between Christmas and New Year's and my dad was determined that I would be born before January 1st because he was going to get that extra tax deduction for the entire year. In fact, my mother swears he made the doctor promise he would get that tax deduction. And he was so adamant that my poor mom, beginning on early on the morning of the 26th, began to walk up and down the street in, my, uh, in our neighborhood. And apparently it worked because only after a day and a half of her walking up and down the neighborhood sidewalks, she did go into labor. And it was so effective that she almost delivered the tax deduction on the freeway instead of the uh, hospital. But my dad was a happy camper. He did get his tax deduction but I, unfortunately, am stuck with a birthday that's only 48 hours after Christmas. Tonight, we're going to look at another birth story. And this is actually a birth story that begins before conception. As we're going to take a look at Israel's final judge, Samuel. And as Israel's last judge, God uses Samuel as a key player in Israel's transition from the leadership of judges to a monarchy that will one day welcome the everlasting and perfect king of kings. The era of judges, if you remember, began after the death of Joshua, and it actually lasts until Samuel, the final judge when he anoints Israel's first king. We're going to see God's sovereign hand and God's purpose on the life of Samuel as he plays a role in Israel's transition from judges to a monarchy. So we're going to be in 1 Samuel this week. So open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 1 with me. And we're going to read together starting in verse 2 about a man named Elkanah and what happens in his family. So look at 1 Samuel 1, verse 2 with me. He, meaning Elkanah, had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of one, the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. So sadly, what we see here is Elkanah is practicing polygamy. One wife, Peninnah, has children, but the wife that he loves, Hannah, is barren. Because God had promised to bless the Israelites with many descendants if they obeyed him, barrenness in ancient Israel was often misconstrued as God's curse on a woman who was guilty of some sin. And Peninnah actually takes advantage of her role as the wife with children to constantly taunt Hannah's barrenness and her supposed sin. But Hannah's barrenness is not the result of sin. Actually, Hannah is an amazing woman of God, and her barrenness is a condition which God uses providentially for his own sovereign purposes. Keep reading with me. Look at verse 9. After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply depressed, distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. 
we get a unique peek into Hannah's true heart here and character. It's unusual to get that kind of look into someone's heart. Samuel's mother here shows us her desire to be relieved of her suffering of barrenness and having no children, but she shows us something else. She shows us her great desire for God to be honored as she offers up a future son as a servant to her God and a leader for Israel. She addresses the Lord here as, O Lord of hosts. Uh, in your Bible, it may say Lord Almighty, but both of those are a picture of God's intimate power as he fights for his people. The phrase, no razors shall touch his head, is a reference to a Nazarite vow. We talked about that last week with Samson. A Nazarite vow is where you set yourself apart from the Lord. You consecrate yourself to the Lord or dedicate yourself to him. And the vow includes not drinking wine, cutting your hair, or defiling yourself by touching a dead body. It's usually a vow that you take for a limited period of time in someone's life. But Samuel's mother here is offering her son to the Lord through this vow for all of his life. In today's world, it would be like offering our unborn child to the Lord for a life of ministry, a life dedicated to ministry. Now, Hannah is not asking for a profession here for her son. She doesn't want a vocation for him. What she's asking for through this vow is that his heart would be fully and completely devoted to the Lord all the days of his life. Now, as Hannah goes on to pray silently, weeping with her lips moving. Eli, the priest, jumps to a wrong conclusion. In ancient Israel, most prayers were audible. They would stand in the temple and pray out loud. And because she is praying silently, Eli, the priest, assumes she is drunk and he confronts her. But her explanation only goes on to further reveal her godly character and her faith in God's hand on her life. Look at verse 14 with me in chapter 1. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. Eli actually changes his opinion of her after hearing her explanation in her heart, and he blesses her. He blesses her. He prays for God to honor her prayer. And we, we see the result of Hannah's prayer and Eli's blessing in verse 20. Look down at verse 20. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. So Samuel's remarkable life and his consecration to a life lived in service to the Lord actually begins before his conception with his mother's prayer. And you know, his mother never wavers from her commitment and consecration that she made before his conception. She recognizes that Samuel's birth is not just a coincidence. It's not just a unique reversal of her physical infertility. But it's a supernatural gift from the Lord. And she names this supernatural gift Samuel, which actually means God hears or heard of God. What a great birth announcement this would make. Can't you picture it if it was on Pinterest, this beautiful vellum paper with um, uh, the name Samuel in big blue letters on there and then... Um, praying hands and the vow that Hannah made underneath those praying hands. And then somewhere in gold, I think it would give the meaning of Samuel's name, God hears. But we don't have any Pinterest here in our story, do we? But what we do have is a clear picture of God's sovereign hand in Samuel's life before his conception. Our God, our sovereign God, our supremely powerful God has a plan for Samuel's life. So let's keep reading. Look at verse 24. And when she had weaned him, she took him up 
with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. The child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing in your presence, praying to the Lord. For this child I have prayed, and the Lord has granted my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. What we see here is Hannah is obeying fully and completely her vow. Samuel's a young child. He's no longer a baby. She's bringing him to Eli, the priest. I have a great picture of that for you so you can visualize it. Samuel has been a divine gift, and now she gives her own gift back to the Lord as she places Samuel's life securely in the hand of the Lord, trusting his sovereign plan for Samuel. You know what she's doing here is actually living out the truth um, of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which um, talks of trusting God's sovereignty. Look at Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Hannah is acknowledging the sovereignty of God in Samuel's life as she returns him according to her vow. Now, verse 28, it closes with the words, he worshiped the Lord there. And there was discussion among theologians about whether this was Elkanah or whether it was Eli. But actually, this could be Samuel. This could be young Samuel's first step into lifelong ministry of service. He could be worshiping the Lord as he walks into the temple for the very first time as a servant of the Lord. Now, most of us would expect that fulfilling her vow and leaving Samuel would be sad and difficult for his mother. She only, may only see Samuel once a year now in their yearly visits to Shiloh. But Samuel's mother's reaction is not sadness, actually. It's one of praise. And we have one of the most beautiful prayers of praise in the scriptures here in the first 11 verses of chapter 2. We don't have time to read it, but uh, go back and read it later. It's incredible. Her praise to the Lord here as she's leaving Samuel at the temple with Eli is an encouragement about Samuel's life for her and for Samuel as she gives her gift back to the Lord. What better gift to give young Samuel than the truth of who God is as he walks into the temple to serve the Lord for all of his life. This amazing prayer of praise in these verses reminds all who read it, all who hear it, of the sovereignty of God as you learn in her prayer of praise of God's salvation, his holiness, his omniscience, his omnipotence, his sovereignty over life and death, over rich and poor, over his people as he protects the faithful and destroys their enemy. Hannah prays this for Samuel and praises her God as Samuel serves for the rest of his life. Um, this prayer of praise marks God's sovereignty in Samuel's new life of service. But look at verse 11 with me. And then Elkanah went home to Ramah, and of course his mother went too. And the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. So his family returns home, and he remains in the temple with Eli serving the Lord. So our first glimpse at um, Samuel, Israel's last judge, reminds us of an important truth, I think. It was important to me as I study it. It reminds us that God is always at work in our lives in unique and powerful ways. He knows us before we are born. He already knows the details of our lives and the length of our days. The sovereign God of all the universe has his hand on our life, whether we see it or not. I became a believer as an adult at the age of 26, and I was really unaware of any deep spiritual heritage in my family at all um, when I became a believer. But a little while after that, I was given my great-grandmother's very well-read Bible, which I didn't know even existed. Um, 
And then shortly after that, I was given a journal from my great-great-grandmother that talked of her deep faith sustaining her during the Civil War and her prayers for her future family if she survived the Civil War. I had a spiritual heritage that I'd never been told about. It was evident that our sovereign God had been at work in my family, even though I was clueless. Our challenge as we look at Samuel's consecration to the Lord, even before he was conceived, is to look for God's sovereign hand on our lives as well. It's there, ladies, I promise you, it is. His supreme, ultimate power is working in our lives, and I'm afraid we rarely recognize it, but it's there. Look at Psalm 139 on your verse sheet, verses 15 and 16. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none. God's sovereign hand in our lives before we are born. And look at Ephesians 1, 4, just up from that. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. God's sovereign hand is on our lives. And when we have our eyes open to the sovereign hand in our lives, just like Hannah, we can praise him for his sovereign work. Praise him for our salvation. Praise him for his power displayed in our lives. What an example these 11 verses in chapter 2 are for us. But let's keep reading. Look at verse 12 in chapter 2. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Okay, so we've seen the human reason for Samuel's birth. His mother was barren and longed for a child. And now we're going to see God's divine purpose in Samuel's birth. Eli has two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Uh, They were priests at the temple and they are worthless godless men. They abused their position as priests by constantly eating the meat that was intended to be sacrificed uh, to the Lord alone. And even more shocking than that, they participated in ritual prostitution that was part of the Canaanite worship on the grounds of the temple. Eli had lost control of his sons and lost control of their behavior as priests. And as a result, we're going to see God reject the priesthood of Eli, his sons, and his future family. Look down. We're going to skip around a little bit. Now look down at verse 31 in chapter 2, where it says, Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. And then 34 And this that shall come upon your two sons, Hopni and Phinehas, shall be the sign to you. Both of them shall die on the same day, and I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. Um, Because of their ungodly behavior, God actually cuts off completely Eli's branch of the Levitical tree. Now we see God's sovereign divine purpose in Samuel's birth. It will be Samuel who will be taking the place of Eli's sons as priest and judge. It will be Samuel who will one day be the priest that anoints Israel's first two kings. In contrast, however, to Eli's blasphemous sons, Samuel is growing closer to the Lord every day. Look at verse 26 with me in chapter 2. Back up a little bit. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. Young Samuel is actually thriving at the temple while Eli's sons are living their blasphemous lives. He is thriving and living out the vow his mother has made. But let's Look and see what happens as Samuel continues to grow. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days, and there was no frequent vision. 
At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place, and the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. And then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, um, but... and. He went and lay down again, and the Lord again called Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. My son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, for the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Now Samuel is probably a young teen here, 12, maybe 13 years old, and he has been faithfully serving the Lord under Eli at the temple. And Samuel is sleeping in the courtyard. The lamp of God is the sanctuary lampstand that is lit all night in the temple. And Eli is sleeping nearby somewhere. And in verse 7, where we read that Samuel did not know the Lord, what that means is um, that Samuel had not previously received a vision, a dream, or a direct revelation from God himself. Now, I am so impressed with Samuel's obedience here. Here is this young teenager that gets up out of his bed, out of sleep, three times with no attitude at all. Um, And he thinks Eli's calling him, and he goes to Eli. Um, What is not impressive here is Eli's spiritual dullness. His spiritual dullness, it takes three times for him to recognize what Samuel is hearing. He doesn't actually hear the Lord's voice himself, but he does recognize what's going on with Samuel. And he instructs Samuel to answer. Look at verse 9 with me. And then Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and calling as as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And on that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. The message that God has for Samuel here is so shocking that the Lord tells Samuel um, that anyone who hears it is going to have this ringing and clanging in his ears. That's what it means when it says his, their ears tingle. Eli's sons are evil, and Eli's had knowledge of their evil ways, has done nothing about it. So as Eli has already been told, the priesthood is going to be removed from his family Now, this cannot be an easy message for Samuel to hear and understand. And he doesn't want to actually tell Eli the message the next morning when Eli calls for him. But Eli insists and Samuel tells him everything. This moment is actually Samuel's first act as a prophet of Israel. The Lord had found a trustworthy mouthpiece for his messages. Look at... um, Verse 19 in chapter 3 with me. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and he let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord again appeared at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. The Lord has found a reputable and reliable mouthpiece and the mark of a true prophet of the Lord is that his words prove true. Samuel's communication as the Lord's mouthpiece was so effective and consistent that his words were accepted by Israel as the Lord's own words. Look at Deuteronomy 18.22 with me. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true... 
That is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. Samuel speaks the truth from the Lord. And because of that, all of Israel from the north to the south recognized that Samuel was God's prophet and that God had returned to the temple in Shiloh and was speaking to Samuel. Now, Eli and Samuel actually both give us a great lesson here as we think about hearing God's voice in our own lives. The night that God calls out to Samuel, both men, the young and the old, are sleeping. But one hears the Lord's voice immediately, and the other hears nothing when the Lord speaks. Now, because of his inexperience, Samuel doesn't immediately recognize what he's hearing, but he does hear the Lord's voice every single time. But the experience priest to Eli never hears the Lord's voice calling out to him that night. Samuel wakens him, but he has never heard the Lord's voice that night. So despite the years of service in the Lord's temple, Eli's hardened hearts have done a unique thing. His hardened heart has closed off his ears as well. He's lost his ability to listen for the Lord. But what we see in young Samuel is that he has a spiritually sensitive heart that opens his ears to the Lord's voice in spite of his inexperience. And that's the lesson we can take from Samuel and Eli. We must be women who listen for the Lord's Lord's voice with a sensitive heart that opens our ears to the Lord's voice every time. Every time we open his word right here, The Lord speaking to us with a sensitive heart, our ears are open to what he has to say. Our ears will be open to him every time we sit with him in prayer when we have a heart that's sensitive. It will have, uh, our ears will hear him speak to us through the wonders of his creation. And when we hear God calling out to us through his word as we read it, through our moments sitting quietly, still before him, Like Samuel, we need to answer and obey. I love Samuel's response here, speak for your servant hears. The Hebrew word that's translated here in our scriptures is not just the mechanical act of the ear translating sound to your brain. It also has the meaning of obedience, of being able to obey. In other words, What Samuel is saying to the Lord here, what we should be saying to the Lord is, speak, Lord, for your servant obeys. If we want to be an instrument in God's sovereign plan, like our judge, prophet, and priest Samuel, we've got to consistently listen for his voice and be ready to reply, speak, for your servant hears. Look at Luke 9.35 on your verse sheet. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. Let's listen with soft hearts and ears that are open to the Lord's voice and be ready to reply, speak for your servant hears. Okay, let's keep reading. And now we are gonna skip way over to chapter seven. So turn with me and your Bibles to 1 Samuel 7 verse 3. And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, if you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth and they served the Lord only. While Samuel was still a young man, the Philistines attacked Israel and managed to capture the Ark of the Covenant. And during that battle, interestingly enough, with the Philistines, both Eli's sons were killed on the same day as it had been prophesied and told to Eli. And then Eli heard about their death later that day and he died as well. But having the ark did not go well with the Philistines. I wish we had time to read that story. It's such an interesting story. A plague fell on every city that tried to house the ark until it was finally sent back to Israel. The Philistines put it on a wagon and sent it back to Israel. 
And the ark, although the ark returned to Israel in just a few months, I think the Philistines had it for seven months, it is 20 years before Israel repents of their idol worship, of worshiping the Baals and the Asherah, and returns to their God. And it is Samuel right here that we just read about in chapter 7 who leads the people of Israel in national repentance after 20 years of apostasy. And we see the cycle of judges here playing out as the oppression by the Philistines has finally led the Israelites to call out to the Lord in repentance. And they agree here under Samuel's leadership to put away the idols they have been worshiping for 20 years and serve the Lord only. So look, let's keep reading. Look at verse five and let's see what happens. And then Samuel says, gather all Israel at Mizpah and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. Now, when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord uh, for Israel and the Lord answered him. You know, Mizpah was just north of Jerusalem. If you still have your map, you may want to get out and look and see where Mizpah, Mizpah was. And it was a common place for Israel to gather. And Samuel's leadership is actually very evident here as he intercedes for Israel. And Intercession for Israel was a lifelong priority for Samuel. He never ceased praying for the nation of Israel and for their needs. And as Israel repents and fasts here before the Lord, the Philistines unwisely see this gathering as an opportunity for them to attack. But Samuel prays and offers up an offering to the Lord, and the Lord answers Samuel's prayers on Israel's behalf, and what he does here is he supernaturally delivers uh, them from the Philistines with a loud noise, some sort of loud thunderous noise that throws all of the Philistines into a panic. Look at um, verse 10 with me. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack, but the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion, and they were defeated before Israel. This supernatural intervention by the Lord um, and Israel's victory actually ended the Philistines' occupation of Israel for all of Samuel's life. Now, one of my favorite hymns is Come Thy Fount of Every Blessing. It's a hymn that was actually written in England in 1758. It's an old hymn by a young man named Robert Robinson. Um, and as I've sung that hymn every single time, I've always wondered in the third stanza what an Ebenezer is. What an Ebenezer, it says, the third stanza says, here I raise my Ebenezer, here by thy great help I've come. I thought wrongly that an Ebenezer was some sort of a banner since they talked about raising it. But actually the meaning in that hymn of Ebenezer comes from 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. So read that with me. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer. For he said, till now the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Okay, so an Ebenezer set up here by Samuel is a monument or a memorial stone that means stone of God's help. Samuel's desire was for the people of Israel to remember 
for decades and generations to come how God rescued his people when they humbled themselves before him because that's what they had been doing as they as the Philistines attacked they were offering making offerings to the Lord and repenting of their apostasy so Samuel sets up a memorial stone this Ebenezer a stone of God's help so that Israel throughout generations and decades will hopefully not forget to humble themselves and follow their God. That is Samuel's hope here with this Ebenezer. But if you know my hymn, it has a verse in there which says, um, prone to wonder, Lord, I know it, prone to leave the God I love. Israel is prone to wonder, despite Samuel's Ebenezer stone. But fortunately, Samuel is not prone to wonder. He does not leave the God he loves all of his life. Look at verse 15 in chapter 7. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, and he went on a circuit year by year to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah, and he judged Israel in all these places. Then he would return to Ramah, for his home was there, and there also he judged Israel, and he built there an altar to the Lord. Now, we have seen Samuel be a priest, taking Eli's uh, place after his death. We've seen him be a prophet as he's clearly spoken the word of the Lord. But even more than those roles, he was Israel's last judge and national leader all the days of his life. He prayed for them. He spoke truth to them. He gave them direction, as you can see from his travels, everywhere he went. But... Samuel's biggest challenge with Israel was yet to come. We're going to finish up here with chapter 8. Look at verse 4 in chapter 8. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed loudly to the Lord. Now God's sovereign hand remains on Samuel, but Israel refuses to recognize God's sovereign leadership on the hand of their nation. It was not sinful for the people of Israel to ask or inquire about an earthly king. But what is dismaying and displeasing to Samuel and to the Lord is for them to insist on their own timing, like a spoiled child that wants candy before dinner, um, for them to insist on their own timing of a monarchy for Israel. You know, it had always been God's plan for Israel to usher in a monarchy eventually that would one day welcome the Messiah as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords over Israel. But here what we see is Israel rejecting God's timing. Samuel, whose very life is the result of God's sovereign time clock, he is totally dismayed and upset by the people's demand for a king instead of their submission to God's sovereign plan. Let's look at God's answer to Samuel in verse 7 of chapter 8. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. And according uh, to all the deeds they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall rule over them. You know, the Lord tells Samuel the ugly truth here. Even though it may feel to Samuel like they're rejecting his leadership as judge over Israel, what the Lord recognizes is the truth that they are are rejecting his sovereign leadership over over them. And just like any good parent, God lets his wayward children have their way to teach them a lesson. And the lesson that Israel is going to learn under many of their earthly kings is that the king they are asking for is going to be a human, not a divine leader. Many of Israel's kings um, 
will oppress them, enriching themselves, appropriating their property, conscripting their children, taxing their land, and sending them off to many wars. Israel would reap the consequences of their decision to replace their loving and powerful sovereign king with a human king. And even though Samuel goes on to tell the people these truths about the king they are asking for, the people refuse to listen. Look at verse 19 in chapter 8 with me. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but there shall be a king over us, that we may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel heard all the words of the Lord, he re all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to, to Samuel, Obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel's story actually does not end here with his deep disappointment with the people of Israel, but his role as judge and sole leader of Israel will change as he goes on in the rest of 1 Samuel, which we're going to study together next year. He goes on to anoint Israel's first two kings, Saul and then David. But what we see with Samuel is we never see him waver despite his disappointment in the people of Israel. He does not waver from his lifelong commitment to his mother's vow before he was conceived. We see that he was committed to the Lord as a tiny boy in the temple, surrounded by old men who were not leading the best lives. He's committed during Israel's 20 years of apostasy and idol worship before he calls the nation back to the Lord in repentance. We watched him... Um, and in this last story, we, we actually see the foundation of his lifelong commitment to the Lord. He didn't always understand what the Lord was doing with Israel, but you know what he always did? He always followed his sovereign God. He followed and submitted his will to God's will. Our calling is just like Samuel's, actually. It's to recognize the sovereignty of God in our lives and then to follow to follow him in submission and obedience. It's what we see our last judge Samuel do all of his life, and it's what we see Samuel do as his leadership transitions Israel to the monarchy that eventually points Israel and us to the king of kings. Our final lesson from Israel's last judge is that we should follow God faithfully and submit to his plans even when his plans are different from our plans, because his plans, unlike our plans, stand firm through all generations. Look at John 10, 27 with me. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And Psalm 33, 11 says, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. It's a lesson that our final judge, Samuel, knew well and submitted to. Pray with me. Father, you're a good and a gracious God. We love you. We pray that we will be women that follow you all the days of our lives and submit to your plans even when they are different from our plans. We thank you for the truth of your word and the lessons that it teaches us. And I pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.